Hi, welcome to an audio test session with APX. These videos provide worthwhile information for APX users and demonstrations on a range of audio measurement applications. In this session, Dan demonstrates digital to analog converter test methods. In this session, we're going to take a look at testing a digital to analog converter within APX 555 audio analyzer. The converter that I'm testing today has a SPDIF input in APX nomenclature that is a digital unbalanced input. Now you'll notice that DACs today come in many shapes and forms and sizes and we may be dealing with a device like I am today with a conventional SPDIF input but we might be looking at a sound bar with an HDMI input. We could be looking at a Bluetooth device or even something at the IC level where we'd be using our digital serial interface to go to an I2S or TDM interface. Regardless of the interface being used, in all likelihood there is an APX digital interface module that will allow you to connect to the device under test. But again, for today we're just going to look at a digital unbalanced now, uh, the sample rate will depend on your specific test requirements. The default of 48 kilohertz is, of course, quite common. Uh, we can set that to anywhere between 22 kilohertz and 192 kilohertz for the SPDIF interface. Now, we can also look at some advanced settings, including whether we're using the consumer or professional variant of SPDIF or AES6, AES3, if you prefer. We can also modulate the rise time of the physical interface and or add noise to it. We can also do tests where we look at the jitter tolerance of the device. We'll return to those a little bit later. The input is in fact just an unbalanced input. So on the APX front panel we're using the BNC inputs. Uh, so in fact the device default uh, selection works just fine. For our high pass and our low pass filters, we can actually just leave those as is for the moment. The next thing I'll do in uh, my general setting up of a test is look and make sure I have a good connection. So I'll just turn the um, digital output on and make sure I'm getting a signal back from the device under test. I can go ahead and make sure I've connected those channels. I'll just test one channel at a time and make sure I get signal back on the appropriate channel. Once I've verified that I'm getting signal from the device under test, I'll just go through all my basic measurements. I'll start at level and gain. And this is a pretty straightforward me measurement. Here we just want to see what is the output level of the device for a given digital input. I'll do this test at full scale, 0 dBFS or 1 FS if you prefer. I can turn the generator on. This shows me that for a full scale input signal, I get 780 odd millivolts from the device under test or minus 2 dBV. You can see this in terms of the gain or sensitivity function of the device which is 780 millivolts per FS. Now we'll go on to THC plus N. Here you can see we have a few more choices to configure for the measurement. Uh, I can go ahead and turn the generator on. Here we have a choice for a high pass filter, a low pass filter, and a weighting function. THD plus N measurements or any measurement that includes noise, uh, it's very critical to understand the bandwidth over which you're measuring it since essentially noise exists at all bandwidth and if we make the measurement full band we'll get more noise than if we make it in a narrow band. I myself prefer to see THD plus N in dB and perhaps we'll do this just below clipping so how about minus 1 dBFS? And we'll see we get a pretty reasonable minus 91 dB. Now we can look at this as a ratio. So the ratio of the noise and distortion products to the total signal. 
or we can look at the absolute level of the noise and distortion products. The ratio of the distortion products, the level of the distortion products, or we can even more finely slice the energy coming back from the device under test and look at just the noise ratio or the noise level. I can also look at the individual harmonic products as a ratio or level. Now these graphs do only show us one channel at a time. If I wanted to be able to see both channels, I might add another primary result. Select distortion product ratio. I'll add that to my analog unbalanced input results. And I can drag that over and I'll set this second instance of the graph to look at the second channel. Of course this is all possible because the measurement is being made in the frequency domain. As you can see down here in the input signal monitor where we're performing an FFT of the live signal coming back from the device, we can look at the output and easily discern the fundamental products, the distortion products, and the noise of the device. Moving on, we can look at the frequency response of the device. Here again, we'll have start frequency, stop frequency, the level at which we want to make the sweep, and how long the sweep will go for. Let's try a one second sweep. Now, this is not uh, a hugely exciting device having a practically flat frequency response, though you can see some rise. And if we change our result view to look at the relative level, we can zoom in on it and we can see that there is approximately, oh, three quarters of a dB of rise at 20 kilohertz. Or we can also look at that as the deviation over the total span. Next, we can look at signal-to-noise ratio. So this is a classic measurement where we want to see the range of the device. What is the maximum output it can put out compared to its own noise floor? So here we want to do this at full scale. And what we're doing here is actually a two-part measurement. Behind the scenes, the analyzer turns on the signal generator at the selected level, measures the output, then it turns the signal generator off and measures just the noise. Then expressing a ratio between the two, we can see it's around 96, 97 dB. Now actually for DACs and ADCs, it's more traditional to measure this according to a standard called AES-17. We have this embodied in a measurement called dynamic range AES-17. This measurement is very similar to signal to noise ratio, but different in a couple key ways. In this measurement, the signal generator is turned on at the maximum level, but then instead of being turned completely off, it is reduced in level by 60 dB, so a fairly small signal, and then that signal is notched out. Now this is designed to prevent devices that might idle uh, their inputs. So fed no signal at all, they might mute their outputs, indicating an artificially large dynamic range. You can see here that uh, there's not in fact a very significant difference, just a couple dB, and that is in all likelihood due actually to the differences in the weighting and passband filters. So if we actually switch this, we'll use the same 20 hertz high pass, 20 kilohertz low pass, and let's change the weighting function to uh, signal path, or in this case, none. This measurement is in fact configured by default to comply with AES-17, but just to give you a comparison of the two measurements. Yeah, so we can see that this device does not appear to mute its output as indicated by the fact that we get near identical results between SNR and dynamic range. Next, we can take a look at crosstalk or the leakage between the channels. Again, I'll do this at full scale. 
The test frequency here, the default is 10 kilohertz. You can obviously change this to whatever you'd like. Normally in electronic devices, crosstalk is a capacitive function. So very classically, you'll see crosstalk rise or channel leakage increase by 6 dB per octave. So the default is just designed to reflect that. And here we'll see the isolation between the left and the right channel is quite good, minus 83 dB. Finally, we can look at the time alignment or interchannel phase between the channels. And we can see that uh, it is essentially within measurement uncertainty, which is pretty much what we'd expect for a DAC. Now I'll add a couple more measurements that are uh, often interesting for digital to analog converters. So I'll add a stepped level sweep. And here what we're going to do is uh, sweep the output level. And again, we can uh, select what range. But the generator level will actually remain the same for the sweep. I would say that uh, in a DAC, we're primarily looking for nonlinearities with amplitude. In a good DAC, of course, there shouldn't be any. We should see a pretty linear device. And in fact, I'll go look directly at the amplitude linearity result. And you can see that this is quite good here. Now, the other result we'll see here is THD or THD plus N as a function of the output level. And this is also pretty good and pretty much what we'd expect. So here, where it's expressed as a ratio to the output signal, we can see that it uniformly declines as we increase the level of the output signal until it just levels off before we reach full scale. Another way to look at that would be as if we looked at the level of the residual noise and distortion. If we're curious, uh, one thing that I like to look at is where, at what level do we get the best THD plus N result? So I'll add a derived result from THD plus N. And I'll say I'm looking for a min, max, or statistics. And I'm looking for a single value result of minimum. So that gives me a new result. And it tells me that the best case is actually almost minus 92 dB. And that's with a generator level of uh, 794 milli FS, which admittedly is a bit of an obscure unit. But just to look at that, I'll go back to our THD plus N measurement. And what we see is not at all uncommon. The best performance in terms of THD plus N is often very, very slightly below full scale. So um, at full scale, minus 90, minus 91, a little bit below full scale, almost minus 92. Not a huge difference, but it's very common to see that sort of behavior. Now, another thing we can look at is a stepped frequency sweep. And here we just want to look at the behavior as a function of frequency. So we'll sweep it from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. I'll do this. Uh, let's do it at sort of the peak level of performance. So here again, we do see some classic behavior. THD plus N, now this is a broadband THD plus N measurement. The input bandwidth is currently 90 kilohertz. But we can see that THD plus N ratio is in fact rising with frequency. Again, that's a very classic behavior for uh, an electronic output stage. Finally, something that can be very interesting to look at for DACs is how they respond to input jitter. What is their jitter tolerance?
So let's start with a jitter level sweep. So what this is going to do is we're going to drive the device with an audio signal consisting of a one kilohertz sine wave. Of course, I could set that to anything I want. And I'll set that again to minus 2 dB. And then we're going to superimpose some jitter on that speed of signal. So we're, in fact, going to jitter the clock that's generating the audio signal. I'm going to do this in terms of the unit interval which is a convenient unit when talking about jitter because it's independent of the sample rate. And the thing that's typically most interesting is to look at THD plus N. And this is actually a pretty classic curve. It's showing us that as we increase the jitter, the actual audio performance of the device is going down. If we did that enough, we might in fact get the device to unlock. So let's go to an even higher level. Uh, no, it didn't unlock. Uh, the performance kept declining, but we'll take a look at that in a second. Now, of course, if I wanted to, I could uh, automate the creation of a report here. I'll just go through and check the results I'm interested in. So let's look at RMS level and gain, THC plus N ratio, frequency response, dynamic range, crosstalk, phase, Let's look at RMS level, but more importantly, the gain linearity and the THD plus N ratio and minimum result from our level sweep. We can look at RMS level and THD plus N ratio from our frequency sweep. And let's look at THD plus N ratio from our jitter level sweep. And now if I run this sequence, I'll get all these results. And I'll get these in a convenient report format that I can uh, view on screen or, of course, save in a variety of formats, including PDF. Uh, I can save it to as a HTML file, rich text, Excel, a text file, or I can even get the data out directly to MATLAB. Now, when I started out, I skipped over a couple of settings that are interesting to look at in the input configuration. So the first is the input bandwidth. Now, if we're only going to test a device in a 20 kilohertz bandwidth, it's very convenient to just set this to 22.4 kilohertz bandwidth. That's running the internal ADCs of the APX itself at 48 kilohertz sample rate and that really will just make the software faster and save us from processing data that we're not interested in. But at the other end of the spectrum if I was interested in seeing the out-of-band components of this converter I might set the bandwidth all the way to 1 megahertz. I'll take our input signal monitor and let's just auto scale the x-axis and here we can see some interesting properties of this converter. It has a bunch of out-of-band noise on one channel and then some interesting uh, spurious products in the other channel. Here, if sort of I wanted to make my measurements all in the same input bandwidth, I could say, hey, 
let's set the high pass filter to 20 hertz and the low pass filter uh, we have these selections AES 17 for 20 and 40 kilohertz those again comply directly with the AES standard for testing digital audio I can select those or in fact I could just select elliptic which is going to be a brick wall style filter so those are quite useful a couple of the other additional questions come up which is well is APX really good enough to measure the converter now in this particular case the converter we're looking at is not extremely high performance so that is not uh, much of an issue but just to explain we might take a look at the APX own residual performance so what I'll do here is now we're looking at the APX itself the APX own residual noise and distortion and if I turn the generator on we can see that the residual distortion of the APX itself is quite low now you'll notice that this is currently reading minus 115 dB so the APX555 is unique among all the APX audio analyzers in having a hybrid architecture. For measuring the very highest performance converters, it's difficult to use a converter. So what the APX has available is both a actual analog sine oscillator. So instead of generating sine waves in the analog domain with a digital to analog converter, will generate them with a very low distortion sign generator and on the input side we can apply an analog notch filter the combination of those two things lets us reach a residual of minus 118 dB or 19 dB at 1 volt or we can in fact get beyond one part per million at 2 volts and that means that you can use the APX555 to measure the very highest performance converters. Obviously a converter that's at uh, minus 90 odd dB for THD plus N can be measured without any problem, but this allows us to measure even state-of-the-art converters. Thank you for joining me in this APX test session. If you have any questions, feel free to email us or reach out to your local partner. Thank you for joining us for this audio test session with APX. For additional videos, visit ap.com or any of our social media channels.